Welcome to this special Zoom event coming to you from the ANU Meet the Author series and organised by the wonderful Colin Steele. Thanks for all you do for our great city, Colin. I'm Alex Sloan and grateful to be broadcasting you from Canberra, Ngunnawal country, a uh, country that was never ceded. And I'd like to acknowledge Indigenous people past and present and thank them for their ongoing custodianship of this land. It really is my pleasure to be speaking with fellow Canberran writer and social researcher Hugh McKay about not just one, but two books, uh, one a novel and one non-fiction. They're not written as a pair, but deliciously they have some crossover themes, particularly that question, who am I, what am I and what makes me? The non-fiction book, The Inner Self, is a book about the way we hide from the truth about ourselves, both as individuals and as human beings. And it describes the psychological freedom of knowing who we really are and argues, she beautifully argues that our capacity for love is the very essence of our humanity. In the novel, A Question of Love, which is actually Hugh's eighth novel, it's what he calls a real book. <laughs> this novel explores the state of a marriage between Richard, an architect, and Freya, a violinist. And in some ways, it's like a case study of some of the themes which Hugh has explored in The Inner Self. Things like denial, projection, guilt, ambition, inhibitions. And it has a, a really unusual structure, uh, adapting the musical theme and variations format to the written word. Hugh is a choral singer. Um, and he has very much looked to Bach's variations for this novel, which I think is a, is a great, beautiful thing to do, a work of art. Hugh McKay, a joy to be speaking to you. Uh, and to you, Alex. Thank you very much. Congra congratulations on both these books. They're, as I said, they're not written as a pair. No, not written as a pair. In fact, the novel uh, was drafted about four years ago but because of the unusual structure, which I was determined to get right, it took quite a long time to get it right. And by the time I was happy with it, uh, I was on the brink of starting work on the nonfiction, the inner self. And my rather astute publisher said, uh, hang on, the, these two kind of fit together. Why don't we hold the novel back uh, and bring it out at the same time as the nonfiction? Because it is a bit like a case study of uh, a couple who are both hiding from themselves and from each other in, in some ways. So they literally came out on the same day, which was um, a, a brave, a brave decision. I hope not courageous in the yes minister. <laughs> <laughs> no, because in the in the novel you you go back again and again on the variations of a husband coming home, so the Richard coming home to Freya's back, and you get the um, perspectives from both both of them, from both Richard and Freya. Which, guess what happens in any relationship? Yes, yes, and with each with each homecoming, with each variation on the theme, the idea is that we peel away a few more layers. Mm -hmm of the relationship and, and of the individuals, particularly Richard, who is the one who's more, more hidden at the beginning and I hope less hidden by the end. But it's a bit like jazz. I mean, uh, you, a jazz musician establishes the theme and then goes off into all these improvisations and then restates the theme at the end. So in fact, the last chapter of the book is almost identical, spot the difference, almost identical uh, to the first chapter, but I hope by the time a reader gets to the last chapter, they're reading it in a completely different way because now they've got insights into both these individuals, some of their family, their professional lives, and their relationship. Yeah, I think I think you've you've really nailed it. It's it's really clever. I'll come back to it, but let's begin with um, go to the nonfiction, which is the inner self, the joy of discovering who we we really are. Um, you say you started writing this after writing the novel. W was there a catalyst for this nonfiction work? Um, I'm not sure whether it's a catalyst. I mean, as usual with these things, it evolves in discussions that go on with my publisher, Ingrid Olson, uh, continuously about other things that might be written. Um, but I think maybe the catalyst was age. <laughs> I think, uh, I mean, I'm at the end of my active career as a social researcher and I've spent all my working life trying to understand and interpret 
and explain what's been going on in Australian society during a very interesting 50 years of Australian society. But it's all been about society, uh, external reality, um, identity in the sense of the, the outer shell that we show to each other. And I, I guess I felt before I was finished, I wanted to get right back to my core discipline of psychology and say, well, all that external stuff is true. When people talk about their personal identity, it's true to say that that's an external construct, that, that you can't discover your identity from looking inside yourself. Identity, as the word implies, is all about how we identify each other, how we tell the difference between Alex and Hugh. And there are all kinds of ways of telling that, but our identity is about difference. Uh, and I thought, well, now what happens when we get to a point which many people do around the middle of their lives? I mean, the classic midlife crisis is often about this very thing of realising that how we appear to each other, that the, that the kind of superficial differences between us, the external visible differences, conceal something else, that, there's a, that there is an inner sense of who I am, which is not always or easily revealed to other people and it doesn't always line up and this is what the midlife crisis is yeah. often about it doesn't <laughs> line up with my appearance hmm, the, you know what was what it all for what's it all about we we you know most of us get to that question quite a few times but i love it that in fact if there was someone that was a catalyst it was an actor um, and yeah. Yes. It was the, I, you know, I so relate to Emma Thompson. She's, um, she's the same age as me and had a daughter at the same age as me. We both had a daughter at 40. So I so relate to this. But tell us the story about Emma Thompson. Yes. Well, uh, yeah, she's, she's possibly my favourite actor. <laughs> um, and uh, when she was on the brink of her 60th birthday, so it was a bit later than the normal uh, a trigger point for people, although, you know, it could be your 80th birthday. Um, but on the brink of her 60th birthday, uh, she suddenly had this sense of, who am I really? And she said she started taking away all the, all the masks from her face, all the roles that she'd had, mother, wife, um, um, actor, um, public celebrity, all of those things. Take all that away and what are you left with? Uh, which which led to the question, who am I really? Which she said, uh, and I think um, many of our audience can probably relate to this, until that point she had always thought it was a really boring question. <laughs> who am I really? You know, sort of agonised, let's go on a weekend retreat to find ourselves. She didn't have any time for any of that, but suddenly she found it the most riveting question of all because she realised that all those masks she'd been wearing mm. were not the whole story. A an important part of the story, I mean, I'm not for a moment saying that the external stuff, the identity, the way we distinguish between you and me isn't important. Of course, it's, it's critically important in our social lives. But what Emma Thompson was describing, which is what I'm dealing with in the book, was there's something underneath all that, there's something behind all that, uh, something that Robert Berezin, an American psychiatrist that I've quoted a few times in the book, describes as the authentic being. And he says, we all sooner or later have a sense of the authentic being, which is not uh, always, in fact, not often not the same as the, as the image of ourselves we project. Mm. And as you say, I mean, you talked about being 80, Emma Thompson at 60 started to say, oh, actually, I find this question really fascinating. Does it take a milestone or even trauma, pain, retrenchment? Does it take something like that for us to kind of really knuckle down and go, okay, who yeah. are we? What yes. are we doing? I mean, there, are, there are some young people who come to this because they seem wise beyond their years. You know, there are, there are adolescents, there are young adults in their 20s who are exploring the idea of the self as different from the identity, uh, the external social identity. But more typically, I think it does need a trigger. And that trigger is often a critical birthday. For some people, it's the birth of the first child. Uh, for some people, it is a life-threatening illness or a relationship breakdown or a retrenchment. I think in 2020, for many people, the trigger has been the pandemic. I think one of the, I mean, the pandemic is a dreadful thing 
uh, from a health point of view and from an economic point of view, but we can see that the upside is many of us have been forced into a position where a bit of introspection was about all we had left to do. Mm -hmm. uh, an, an opportunity to do what might, we might not have done yet, which was use some of this time to reflect on what, what really matters to me, what's important, what, what, what kind of person do I really want to become and, and who is the real me? What, what's important um, particularly, and I suppose the questions coming out of COVID-19 will be, what do we want the world to be? Mm. Um, you know, we are throwing up great big things. In, in the end, it doesn't matter how much money or how much fame or, you know, we're all having to stay at home and, and pull together, we hope. Yeah. Um, to get to get through this and and I think it's probably come back to that we're you know we're a biological unit on this living planet yes. <laughs> and yeah. maybe we start to think about that as well, well. That, that, that that edges us very close to the core message of the book in fact Alex because yes uh, uh, the coronavirus does not distinguish between the young and the old, the rich, the poor, the Buddhists, the Hindus. Uh, I mean, the, the, a pandemic uh, or any, any, yes, any disease is a reminder of the fact that we are a single species. Uh, it certainly, it affects different people in different ways, but invading us, there's no, there's no selection process that the coronavirus is not triaging us uh, and saying, oh, Alex looks like a, a juicy specimen to invade. Not at all. Uh, we're, we're, it's humans. Yeah. Uh, and that's the beginning of, of a serious realisation about what it means to be me, what the, what the inner self is about. When we go deeply into ourselves, we discover something that seems a bit like a paradox, that we, we discover something that is actually not unique, like our externally constructed identity, but we discover our common humanity. We get, we get this blinding insight. I, I, I think of it as our personal moment of enlightenment when it dawns on us that we are indivisibly part of a particular species with particular characteristics. Mm. You've um, chosen a quote from Danish philosopher um, Soren Kierkegaard um, at the front of your book, Hugh, and the quote is, the deepest form of despair is to choose to be another than oneself. Yes, 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 I love that quote um, uh, because I think many of us, until we come to this moment of enlightenment, this moment of insight about who we really are, do live with a, a peculiar kind of despair, that was his word, but it's a kind of despair uh, that arises from being inauthentic. And I don't think until we come to a deeper understanding of the inner self, I don't think we understand where that despair comes from, which is why people often say, and I feel vaguely restless, you know, I feel there must be more to life than this. Uh, I don't know, I'm just out of sorts. I feel lethargic. Uh, um, people say I'm a bit hard to get to know. Uh, you know, my partner seems irritated with me a lot of the time. Uh, we don't understand where this comes from, but I think where it does come from is that we are not being authentically ourselves and other people pick that up. Uh, so this... And in this book, um, you then talk about the top 20 hiding places. Um, explain what these are. Here. Yes, yes. I said when we go deeply inside ourselves and discover that we are essentially human, that we're part of uh, a species, uh, that's, that's the biggest single, and I, and I think the most inspiring, uh, truth about us as well. And I said, that's not unique. But what is unique is how we respond to even a half-formed sense of that truth about ourselves. Now, in order to explain that, I need to take one step back. When you, when you look at what it means to be human, what it means to belong to a social species, which is what humans are, we're, we're hopeless in isolation. We absolutely need families, neighbourhoods, groups, communities, workplace colleagues, choirs, football teams. All we are—we are naturally sociable. That's our 
that's our nature. Not all the time, we need solitude and isolation as well, but our character as a species is that we're social. And so our health, including our mental health, depends upon belonging to groups, communities, neighborhoods, etc., that are functioning. How do they function? They function when enough of us understand that it's our duty as humans to promote social harmony. And how do we promote social harmony? This is a long answer to your question. Sorry, Alex. Uh, how do we promote social harmony? Well, we do it by treating each other always and without exception, kindly and respectfully, because we are fellow humans, because we are all part of this one thing called humanity. But that's a very demanding uh, responsibility that that's laid on us for being human uh, as a as a born, I'm born to love I'm born to be compassionate I'm born to be kind to you whether I like you or not whether I agree with your politics or not you and I are in this together we're humans uh, we're part of the same community we've got to treat each other with the respect and the kindness the compassion that's due to us now of course we find that sometimes a really <laughs> big demand. So it's not surprising that we hide from it, that we find all kinds of clever ways of ducking our responsibility to be compassionate. I, in the book, I use the metaphor of a, a kind of personal solar system, where I say, think of yourself as being like a solar system. The sun at your center is love is your capacity for compassion your capacity to show this kind of kindness uh, towards other people uh, and you have planets revolving around that sun which are your distinct characteristics and because they're rotating like real planets our metaphorical planets are constantly providing the dark side uh, as they ro rotate in and out of the light uh, or if you want to put it more simply any light cast shadows, including our capacity for love, which is the light at the centre of our lives. So there are, there are plenty of shadows on offer when we decide that we don't want to be kind. Uh, in fact, we, we feel quite indifferent towards something. We don't want to be tolerant because our prejudices are too much fun. Um, we don't want to be selfless because at this moment we've got some ambition that we want to satisfy. I uh, don't want to treat this person with respect because I feel contempt towards them. All those things are very human, uh, uh, human responses, but they all deny our true nature. So in the book, I've, I've listed what I've rather cheekily called the top 20. Uh, I'm sure some readers will say, well, I could give you another 20, mate. Um, but these are, these are my top 20 reflecting on all the people I've ever known and all the hiding I've ever done and watched other people do. Um, but they are places where, and some of them seem like a strange thing to call a hiding place because some of them we get praised for and some of them, of course, are not hiding places. I mean, some people use busyness as a hiding place, but some people are just busy and there's nothing they can do about it. And they wish they weren't so busy. It's not a hiding place for them. Yeah, the busy, one, the busy one is great. You know, it's, it's a bit of a, a mantra in Australia. How are you going? Busy? Yeah, oh, yes. yeah. It's a pat on the back, you know. Yeah, it's, it's if you're busy, you've got meaning, you know. It's become a become a badge we wear, you know. The switch is on or off. You're either busy or you're dead. Um, so, uh, but, but that's a classic example of um, when you're busy, if you're using busyness as a hiding it's a very clever hiding place because people won't criticise you for being busy. They'll praise you for being busy. Don't disturb Daddy. He's busy. Uh, oh, I couldn't come to that. I'm busy. You know, oh, he's busy. Um, I couldn't respond to your email immediately. I was a bit busy. Uh, well, that's a great way to, hire, to, to absolve ourselves of the responsibility from looking inside and seeing whether this is the authentic me being so busy or whether my busyness is a hiding place, not just from my authentic self, but from other people around me. It's a great insulator. It's a, it's a great barrier to social cohesion. I've, I've been thinking about this, Hugh, and, and I thought, yes, that the busy one is, is something. And if you do the barbecue test, you say, are you busy? But if someone came back and went, 
and I, if I go to the top of your list, which you've done it in al alphabetical order, your top 20 hiding places, so addiction. So if I came back to the person and said, well, actually, I'm fighting addiction with alcohol, and I then went into a long kind of description of my addiction to alcohol, whether or not my fellow Australian or fellow human being wants to hear that, that's the other thing. Do they, do they really want us out of our hiding places? You've just got on mute, thank you, yeah, for a minute. Um, uh, no, they, they don't want to hear it, but we need to hear it ourselves. No, no one else wants to know about your hiding places, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to list them all off. <laughs> This is private information. Uh, it's a I secret. I into my smartphone here. <laughs> it's a secret between you and your inner self. And although when I say no one wants to know about it, of course, our nearest and dearest often do know this about us. There are plenty of um, uh, close relationships, partners, friends, colleagues, where people know that we're hiding. They're probably not prepared to say to us, I think you're hiding from yourself. But often other people pick it up even before we do and they understand that we're using some of these strategies like relentless ambition or an addiction or our busyness or our devotion to work uh, or our nostalgia uh, or our materialism. All of these are classic uh, hiding places uh, and it is sometimes obvious to other people that there's something a bit neurotic about this, that I'm I'm actually, you know, I'm so nostalgic, I seem to prefer the past to the present. So what am I hiding from? Well, the answer, of course, in that case, I think nostalgia is one of the slipperiest of the hiding places. The answer in that case is I'm probably hiding from the uncomfortable knowledge that I'm not truly myself now, and I think that I preferred the self I used to be back in that era that I pretend to prefer, the 50s. How wonderful were the 50s? I was there. Great, great, great time for women and um, people of yeah. colour. <laughs> time for domestic violence, crime, yeah. road fatalities. Yeah, oh, yes. <laughs> um, I, I got to your um, hiding place, fatalism. It is what it is. Yeah. And this has been borne out. I mean, President Trump has just said that exact thing when asked, was pressed about their response, the US response to COVID-19. It yeah. is what it is. It is what it is. I think I'll scream the next time I hear that, but, but I won't have to wait long to scream because we're saying it all the time. Mm. Uh, it's the sort of contemporary version of que sera, sera. Um, now, sometimes that's a very wise and sensible response to what's happening. If you've been diagnosed with a terminal illness and you know it's just a matter of months, it's very appropriate to say, well, it is what it is. Uh, if you've been retrenched, well, it is what it is. But that's only half the story, isn't it? We want to say, we want to hear, uh, it is what it is and, here's my response. It is what it is and here's what I'm gonna do about it. I fear, that it's become such a popular little saying that instead of, instead of it being uh, the beginning of a statement about how I'm going to address the situation I'm in, it's just like throwing up your hands in a fatalistic way and say, well, there's, well, there's nothing I can do about it beyond my control, go with the flow, that's the way it is. And that leads to fatalism, uh, nihilism uh, and disengagement. I mean, if we, if we lived by the it is what it is philosophy, we wouldn't be much use to the enrichment of our neighborhood or the enlightenment of our kids or anything else. We'd just be people who shrug and say it is what it is. It's a very dangerous cliche. Mm. Uh, another great one is victimhood. Um, yeah. But where, and I think particularly in times like this, with conspiracy theories really getting a run, um, you know, just looking around for someone to blame, they must be the problem. Yes. It's, it's a huge one. It's a great yeah. discussion in your book. Yes, well, victimhood is a, is, a, is a classic hiding place. Now, again, I have to say it's not always a hiding place. I mean, some people have been so brutally victimised one way or another that they do actually feel like victims because they are. And the only way for us to respond to them is with compassion and kindness and as much support as we can muster uh, to try and 
help them heal the wounds. But when people play the victim in, in, in the way that you've just described, uh, when people think it's always someone else's fault, don't blame me for how, look look at the look at the child, look what terrible parents I had, or look what a rotten boss I've got, or whatever it might be. Um, when when people play the victim, uh, what they are doing is hiding from the, their responsibility to be compassionate, kind, loving people. Uh, I mean, a, a victimhood. Uh, I, I think I think a good way to think about victimhood uh, is um, an abdication of responsibility, mm. uh, but also I think, uh, sadly, rather pathetically in a way, it's a sign of something that runs very deep in all of us, which is our desire to be heard, our desire to be noticed, our desire to be taken seriously. That's perhaps the most profound of all the human desires. And the tragedy is that sometimes people feel they're not being taken seriously, they're not being acknowledged or, uh, or noticed or listened to, and only by playing the victim uh, can they get a bit of attention or a bit of sympathy. Mm. So sometimes, as with all these hiding places, I mean, uh, this is not a book that attacks people for hiding. It, it's a book that really reminds us that often other people hiding is something we can do something about, or that we can help them, uh, ease them out of their hiding place, not by saying, hey, you're hiding, uh, but by reassuring them that we love them as they are, that they can be um, more, more authentic, more transparent, and we're not going to die of fright. Because you've incorporated um, your beautiful social research that you've done over many, many years, um, where you've met with people, you've heard their stories, and you've got the story of Dennis and Sasha and Dennis's smartphone addiction, um, which did really ring a bell with me, Hugh, um, I'm afraid. Um, but that, that is a fantastic one. They, they put a, a restriction on their children using their smartphone, and then Sasha says, actually, Dennis, guess what? Same applies to you. Yes. <laughs> he doesn't like it. He confiscates his phone for a week, and it's uh, it's a it's a dramatic little story, which has a very happy ending, I should assure um, our potential readers. But of course, that's an example. I mean, information technology has become a classic hiding place because something when you turn that phone on, and some people, of course, never turn it off, but when you look at that phone, something is always happening. There is all, and that, and that was Sasha's uh, complaint about Dennis, that she felt he had become inaccessible to her because he was hiding in his phone or in his emails. Um, and, and he eventually saw the truth of what she was saying. But that is the temptation. When you've got something that's coming at you all the time, there's always something on that screen. There are always more messages, and if there aren't more messages, there's something you can scroll through the history of messages, uh, or just check what's you know some someone's Facebook post, whatever. It's, it's a it's a, a place of constant activity and stimulation, and that of course is very dangerous when it comes to the inner journey, when it comes to keeping in touch with our inner life, because that's a, a very external uh, kind of activity and, and uh, can act as a great insulator between us and the inner self. Mm. And I suppose, you know, with, to, to stay with the um, Dennis's addiction to his phone, the online world, social media, um, and that is, you know, where a lot of people turn to to be either comforted and there's a lot of beautiful things that you can get on social media and then there is the outrage and the anger and the nastiness. Mm. Do you not start to despair? You, you remain quite optimistic, don't you, Hugh, about this time in our history and us realising what we're doing to ourselves? Yes. Yes, I do because I think the history of the humans, well, partly because of what I've been saying about our core quality the essential human quality, which is compassion, because the species needs that in order to survive. So we have a history of bringing ourselves back from the brink of chaos. Uh, when it looks as though we've lost our capacity for compassion, we find it again, uh, whether that was due to wars or other terrible things we've done to each other. Um, and I think this 
this madness with information technology and particularly social media and particularly the dark side mm -hmm. of social media, the whole trolling phenomenon and so on. Uh, I think that's uh, so bad for us that it's eventually going to dawn on us that for us and for our children or our grandchildren, this is a deeply unhealthy expression of the darkness that's in all of us, but it's only there because the light casts the shadow and we'd better get back into the light. And we usually do, and I think we will again. I think we'll, I mean, there was a time when people thought reading was the work of the day, you know, that the printed word was the work of the people burying their nose in a book. They were disconnecting from their families. And there was a time when television was regarded as something that was taking us away from our inner life and, and, and our relationships. And of course, that was true. There was a time I was around when that happened, when television entered our lives and everyone went mad about television and invited neighbours in to come and watch I Love Lucy, uh, etc. Uh, uh, and, you know, the television was a kind of magical thing that we worship rather in the way we're now worshipping information technology. But we, we moved beyond that. Television is now parked in the corner and maybe it flickers away or, you know, we take out of it what we want rather as we take out of the fridge what we want. We don't think isn't the fridge a miracle, but the smartphone is still a miracle, but we'll incorporate it into saner lives in the next generation or two. But I suppose it's, it's giving voice to the ugliest sides of us, you know, the things that would have perhaps been said out of the side of the mouth down at the pub mm. or wherever actually get now sent. I mean, just the, the recent example of the wonderful Magda Zhivansky doing the health promotion for, for, you know, we send our love to people in isolation in Melbourne and, you know, Hugh talking about how much we'd love to gather together. I mean, if, if you're um, joining us from Melbourne, we're sending our love and we, we know the death toll there is terrible, but the numbers are getting better. But Magda making a beautiful health ad and then getting the most revolting trolling online. I mean, it makes you despair. Mm. Well, it, it makes you despair, yes. Uh, that's, that's incredibly, well, it's unkind for a start, worse than, worse than unkind. It's loathsome, but it's there. And it's there because all of us have dark stuff within us. But as you say, the, the, the phenomenon of the internet and social media allows us to unleash this anonymously, it must be said, <laughs> Uh, on a very large stage. Uh, now, that, that's bringing out the worst in us. But I think because it is so ugly, because it is such a nasty demonstration of the dark stuff that's in all of us, we are eventually, as a society, going to find a way to control that, to encourage people to put all that stuff back on the leash. If that was left uncontrolled, um, life would become intolerable. I mean, um, people on the road uh, sometimes shout at their fellow motorists the most revolting obscenities and abuse because they know they can't be heard and they can't be identified, but they don't actually run into them. Uh, so the internet, social media has provided us with a place where we can both hide and shout. Uh, now, I don't, I don't think that's the way of the future. I don't think the species is going to turn darker as a result of that because that isn't how the species... I mean, if we, if we actually translated that, transported all of that into our actual social lives, into the way we behave with our colleagues or in the uh, queue at the coffee shop or at the checkout in the supermarket or something, life would become unsustainable. We would descend into chaos. And that's not the kind of species we are. So it's a very, very ugly phase we're going through, but I think it's a phase. And, and beautifully, um, Hugh, you have dipped into many of our great thinkers and philosophers um, throughout history um, for this book, The Inner Self. Um, a, a friend of mine who's studying Foucault at the moment said, oh, a hiding place, is, is that a Christian concept? Uh, well, not at all. I don't, uh, I don't, I mean, I, I personally came out of the Christian tradition as a, as a kid, as a young adult. Um, I, I, th I think this is an almost universal, there's a point in which I, in which I quote 
everyone from Marcus Aurelius to Iris Murdoch and Philip Larkin, all saying roughly the same thing about the essence of humanity being love. And the proposition that uh, the dark side of us, the hiding places, are a response to the demands of love. Um, I mean, that's, um, it feels like my take on everything I've learned over the years from observing people, from reading, thinking, etc. Um, I don't think it's specifically uh, Christian, although I suppose it, it's true that every religious tradition is even though many religions become corrupted by their own institutional power and we know all sorts of horrible things are done in the name of religion. In fact, religion uh, and science uh, are two of the, or one of the, bracketed together, one of the hiding places I mentioned on my list. But but more fundamentally, the, the, the purpose of religion, the, the reason why religion has evolved uh, through human history and the, the role of uh, all the major religions is to promote compassion. That, that's what they try to do. They try to get us to live better, uh, to live more kindly, more lovingly, etc. Um, so it wouldn't be, I mean, it, the idea that when we hide from love or the demands of love, uh, this bring, can bring out the worst in us, would not be any more Christian than it would be Buddhist or Muslim or Hindu. In your novel, and I noticed in an interview you did in the Canberra Times, you go, this is what I call a real book. <laughs> Which, and this is your eighth novel, um, yeah. a, a Question of Love. I must, say, I must say, I think, just to put it in perspective, my, my novels have been comprehensively ignored by the reading public. <laughs> Not by me, uh, me, and I notice there's a crossover. Um, there's a crossover character in this book ah, that comes well, from well, selling the dream. Well, of Alex, yes, yes. <laughs> Lincoln the Hunter makes a return appearance. Yes. <laughs> but but why? Um, tell me about the importance of a novel for you, and the importance of this novel, A Question of Love. This is the story of the marriage between Richard and Freya that we see looked at again and again and again to finally reveal what's going on. Mm. Uh, look, I think this all starts in childhood. I, I was one of those people for whom books were a hiding place. <laughs> I, I always had my nose in a book, uh, and that hasn't that hasn't stopped. Um, and I always uh, preferred reading fiction. And as I grew into my early adulthood, uh, and and since, I always felt that to get to the real truth about human nature, to to get to understand how it really is for people and to try and explain why people behave the way they behave. Even, even as a student of psychology, I would say a psychology textbook will give you a framework for thinking about it, but it won't be anything like as revealing as the great novels. Go to literature to find out what makes humans tick. Uh, I really believe that, which is why I made that somewhat facetious remark in that interview about when my first book was published, a book called Reinventing Australia, which was a kind of compendium of a whole lot of my research at that point. Didn't feel like a real book. I didn't feel like a genuine author. I just felt like it was another research report just multiplied up a bit. And it wasn't until my first novel was published, I thought now I'm actually a writer. Um, but but my readers disagree. I mean, they 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 think that the nonfiction is uh, is what I do. But I, I have enormous um, faith in my own fiction. I mean, I do take it very seriously. And and this latest book, The Question of Love, perhaps more seriously than than any of its predecessors, because this was when I decided. I was just. I, I wasn't. There, there's not going to be no car chases, no murders. You know, no, no skydiving. Uh, this was going to be a really intimate forensic exploration of what it is actually like when two people are in an intimate relationship. I mean, it was kind of like uh, a, a researcher's dream uh, that I was going to be a fly on the wall in the home of 
Richard and Freya and I was going to know everything that was going on. And of course, all my professional life, that's what I've wished. But I, you know, I've, I've, I've interviewed someone at great length or I've listened to friends and neighbours in a group discussion. We got to the end of the conversation. I've uh, walked out and gone to my car and driven home and thought that, that was fantastic. But how much more is there? What's the rest of the story they've got? So I'm, I'm sure in your broadcasting career, you must often have felt at the end of an interview, but I need two more hours to yeah. get the essence of this. Uh, so this book was, was really my attempt to say, okay, no holds barred. We're going to get right inside this. And one of the features of it, um, which some readers um, may find slightly puzzling early on, I hope the point of it becomes clear as we go on, is that Richard and Freya, rather look as though they wouldn't work. So this was a partnership that would not be very successful. They're so different. Uh, and he's so secretive about so much of, of himself and his background and the death of his mother and all kinds of things that we only learn as we go along. And, I, and that's one of the things I've tried to demonstrate in this novel, that no one who isn't actually inside a relationship can understand a relationship. That there are many marriages, partnerships, where you say, how on earth do they, how come they're still together after 30 years? Uh, it's a very improbable thing. And you could read this and say, there's a lot of stuff about Richard I'd find too annoying. Why does Freya put up with this? And the answer about human nature, and it's to do with the inner self, the answer about human nature is we often put up with all kinds of things because we do love someone. Mm. Improbably love them and therefore become improbably tolerant. And it, it, I mean, that's, that's what's so beautiful about, um, uh, about this book. I mean, he comes home and says, <laughs> says every night when he walks in, home is the sailor, home from the sea and the hunter home from the hill. I, I looked it up and actually heard Robert Louis Stevenson reading this requiem and I won't give away I won't give it away Hugh what why he says this but that's, yeah Freya has no me. idea she has that, no idea why he's saying this yes yes and that is a, that is actually an example of the fact that I mean the, on, on one of his homecomings we get inside Freya's head when he's saying this and she's saying to herself don't say it don't say it but I've actually always thought that as I read this book, I've always thought that when, when um, you know, tragically relationships break up and everyone has an opinion and I've always thought no one knows what's going on between them and it's no one else's business yes. and it's, yeah, you, you can never know what's going on in a relationship. Yeah. So uh, um, anyway, by the end of the book, for reasons we don't need to explore, Freya becomes so <laughs> sympathetic to this nightly recital that she almost wants to join in but characteristic of humans again she won't join in because she thinks that might embarrass uh, Richard uh, even even at the end when they know so much and we know so much about both of them uh, there's still this tendency to be restrained and to hold hold things back mm. but I, I, I do think one of the well one of the pleasures of writing that novel and I hope one of the pleasures of reading it is that getting such an intimate glimpse into someone else's relationship is very clarifying for our own. Mm. You say that underlying all our reasons for hiding from ourselves is our relax reluctance to face the question, what will be required of me if I get to the core of who I am? Yes. It could yes. be quite devastating once I get there. Yes, that's right. I think that there are two things that, that restrain people from the inward journey. Uh, that's one of them that, you know, well, you know, when I find, when I find out what's going to happen next, and of course, what's going to happen next is I will realise that, that I, I need to become a more compassionate person in, in my dealings with everyone from a partner to a stranger on a bus. Uh, the other thing that inhibits people, I think, and I've, I've so often heard people say this, that they think they'd rather not know what's inside. They, they fear the dark stuff as though there would only be dark stuff and as though they hadn't realised that it's only dark because there's light, that there's contrast within all of us. But those are the two great inhibitors. 
Mm. Now, Hugh, Hugh, I think well, we've got a lot of questions. We've got quite a few questions and, you know, I want everyone um, to, to get their questions to Hugh while I'm talking to him. And just let me have a look at them. Um, what are the ways to discover your true self? Meditation, asking others how they see us. Have you got any other suggestions? Mm. Yes, meditation is demonstrably a wonderful way of doing it. Um, but I think introspection, even without the formal structure of meditation, uh, I, I think running a, running a movie in your head of the day and looking at yourself introspectively and saying, now, was that me? Did I let myself down? Did I let other people down? Was I less compassionate than I could have been? Just reflecting almost as a daily discipline on that is, is going to get us very quickly mm. to, <coughs> excuse me, to the essence of who we are. <coughs> Some people uh, seek the advice of a, of a counsellor or a psych psychotherapist to help them on this, uh, on this process. Have a drink there of good cold camera water. It yes. um, comes naturally chilled, um, which we love. <laughs> Um, Alan Spira has, he's got a couple here. I think he's, um, what does Hugh mean when he talks of the inner self? Is it just a more virtuous form of ourselves or does it transcend our identities? It certainly transcends our identity. It's interesting uh, that the word virtuous has come up. I, I wouldn't have said that. And yet, of course, compassion uh, is associated with other virtues. We, we become courageous, we become tolerant, uh, we become kind, etc., because we are driven by uh, compassion as our core characteristic. Um, I, I, I certainly think once we are enlightened in the sense that I've been describing it, once we have a sense of uh, the inner self, we are bound to be nicer people. I mean, you, you can't make this discovery about yourself and easily set it aside. We do sometimes set it aside. Sometimes, uh, as with our morality, sometimes we know what is the right thing to do, but for various reasons, we're not going to do it. Uh, we're going to do what we want to do, which we know is not the right thing to do, but it satisfies some other desire. Uh, well, it can be like that in being true to ourselves. But I think once we've got a glimmer of understanding that the human core quality is compassion, it's a bit hard to set it aside because we know what we're doing when we set it aside, when we hide from it, is we are actually diminishing ourselves. We are becoming less truly human. Mm. A, a question from Natalie. Um, Hugh, how do we resolve the dilemma that our external identities, which are often based on the characteristics we share with specific groups, sometimes block our ability to identify with all, uh, with all people who share our inner reality as a single human race. Yeah, yeah, what a wonderful question. Mm -hmm. that, that really does go to the heart of the identity problem. I mean, we've gone mad uh, over identity. It, it's, an, it's an overworked thing now. We're endlessly agonising about the Australian national identity and we've got identity politics with all kinds of groups uh, wanting to assert their identity and their difference and their need for special treatment and so on. Some of those groups, of course, do need special treatment. I'm not denying that. But the obsession with identity masks our common humanity. And that, I think, is, is the point of the question. We can identify so strongly with a group, whether a political, ethnic, religious, professional, or some other uh, group, that that seems as though that's who we really are. And it's very easy then to think of people not in that group as other, alien, inferior, all that sort of stuff. Um, go a little deeper. Recognise that anything to do with our identity, even if it is our ethnicity, even if it is our gender, even if it is our core religious beliefs, whatever it is, that's all the, 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 the shell that we present to distinguish between us and others and behind it and beneath it, there is a deeper human truth that has nothing to do with gender, nothing to do with ethnicity. I mean, if you think of the soul, that's a, a rather mystical way of think, thinking about this. I mean, self and soul, perhaps in almost interchangeable terms. But it would be crazy to think of soul having a gender 
or soul having ethnicity. <laughs> We're talking about the essence of the human being. And it does transcend, it's a very good word that the questioner used, it transcends all of that stuff and, and takes us to a more universal uh, connection. That's very nice here, all that rubbish that we go through of gender wars and racism, <laughs> just as you say, um, when it comes to the soul. Um, a question from Ray, which says, Hi, Hugh, I love your optimism. The dark side of social media attacks and the dark side of humans generally in shouting at each other and holding firm on prejudices. Do you think we are now seeing the consequences of that unfold in the worst way currently in the United States? They are ripping themselves apart. We, we get some of that here too, Ray. Um, what, what do you think, Hugh? Yes, yes. Um, we are seeing a very nasty example of it in the US, but there are other countries around the world where we're also seeing some pretty nasty examples of it. And, and as you say, Alex, let's not be too enthusiastic about pointing the finger. Let's acknowledge that in Australian society, we've still got a great deal of work to do. Um, the dark side is expressed most confidently when it's expressed anonymously. And, and it will be a wonderful thing, and I'm sure some techno whiz will be able to develop the, the answer to this, that anonymity on the internet will give way to transparency. So we'll know who you are. Uh, and once that happens, people will be much less inclined to foment all this hatred and prejudice and, and lies and rubbish, conspiracy theories, etc. Uh, that, that's darkened our, our moral and cultural landscape. Yes, America is, um, is in a terrible mess, uh, and it's not all Donald Trump's fault, but lots of countries are in a terrible mess, and lots of streets and neighbourhoods in Australia are in a mess, though they're in less of a mess now than they were before the pandemic. I think a lot of us have rediscovered that the people we live near uh, uh, a, a very particular responsibility for our reservoir of compassion. Yeah, we, um, when we saw a young 26-year-old woman of colour chased out of Australia for daring to have an opinion, which she took down. But, you know, the, the story of As Yasmin is one of our great disgraces. Yes, it, absolutely. It, it breaks my heart. Yes. That yes. happened to that beautiful, incredibly smart Australian. Yes. Was yes. chased out. So, yes. um, Amy Chan, oh, the writer and I. Sorry. Just one other thing about all this hatred and dark stuff. One of the one of the favourite human hiding places is projection, and projection is where we project stuff in us, negative, nasty stuff, onto other people. And a lot of what goes on in the darkness of social media is people projecting blaming others, criticising, attacking others for things that they half consciously know uh, are in themselves. Mm -hmm. um, Amy has asked a question. The, right, the writer Anais Nin once said, Anais Nin, I should say, there are many ways to be free. One of them is to transcend reality by imagination, as I try to do. Could novel writing be another example of creating a hiding place for oneself? <laughs> uh, 10 out of 10, Amy. <laughs> of course it could. Uh, and uh, so isn't it good that I write both? <laughs> uh, most of what I write is non-fiction. Look, I'm absolutely prepared to admit that I love getting off into the business of writing fiction. Um, it, is, it is the work of imagination, and to some extent, imagination fantasy is an escape from reality, but it can also help to clarify reality as, as long as we remember to come back. Mm. Um, actually, Alan is back asking what your favourite um, and most influential novels. Have you got a sort of... Oh. When you say they reveal, you know, you find novels, and I, I agree with you, they reveal so much about the human character oh, for me. Well, it's, a, it's a really long list. And all the novels of Iris Murdoch, all the novels of Anthony Powell, all the novels of Richard <laughs> Ford, uh, most of the novels of Julian Barnes, uh, uh, you know, plus some of the some of the greats from the past. Many of the novels of Charles Dickens. Um, uh, it's it's it, it, it's it's a, it's a I'm sure 
the case that that novels that survive, novels that become classics, become classics because we see ourselves in the mirror that they hold up mm. to human existence. I, I remember, and I think it's actually 25 years since um, Colin Firth burst and dived into the pond as Mr. Darcy. But I remember a the friend... Scene, which, by the way, does not occur in the novel. No, I know. And he dived onto a mattress, apparently. But anyway, I remember a friend going, I, uh, he was a male, going, I can't watch this. This is too emotionally violent for me in terms of Pride and Prejudice and the kind of observations about human nature. Yeah. And it's yeah. true. I mean, I thought, well, that, that's actually, you yeah. know, you can crush it. Added, I should have added the novels of Jane Austen to yeah. that. Of course, there's a long, long list. <laughs> um, Tanya, um, we work... We work on the house, we work on the garden, we work out, but it's seen as self-indulgent if we work on our inner selves. Why is it not given more priority? It's a great question. Mm, it is. Uh, working on the house, working on the garden, working on all that stuff, that's all identity building. It's all about the shell, choosing our job, choosing our partner, uh, choosing what sort of car we'll drive, how we'll talk, what we'll wear, what sort of garden we'll have, all identity building and mostly the first half of our lives is devoted to that. Um, I don't think that going inside, uh, triggered by the sort of thing we were discussing earlier, is hard work at all. I think once we begin to introspect about what it means to be human, about what kind of person I would like to be in the world, what I'd like people to say about me after I've gone, it, it's pretty easy to see where that's going to lead us. The hard work, of course, comes in trying to um, deal with our tendency to hide from that. Uh, that that's, that's the challenge. Find, finding the inner self, I think, is not hard. Dealing with it, living in a way that's true to it, that is the hard work. Making the change. Uh, and it's work that's typically associated with the second half of life uh, when people get better and better at it. <laughs> it's one reason why there's this famous U-curve about life satisfaction, which shows, generally speaking, we reach the point of least life satisfaction around about our 40s, our middle years, and then it climbs and climbs and climbs. By the time you're 80, um, you're feeling a lot more satisfaction than when you were 40. Uh, and I think that's typically to do with the fact that you have paid less attention to the outer shell become more closely in touch with who you are and be more prepared to live as if that is who you are. Mm. I think this might be the final question and it's from Tanita. Hugh, how do we reconcile the tension between finding and living true to our inner compassionate self and the constant cultural pressure to strive, compete and improve ourselves? A pressure that tends to accompany a belief that we are less than and we should and could be. Mm. Yeah, well, it is a wonderful question to end on. Um, and and that's, uh, th that goes right to the core of this point we were just discussing, that all the social pressures are about burnishing our outer shell. It's all about buy this stuff, go on this holiday, holiday even write this book, do something uh, to distinguish yourself, to make your mark, to, to let people identify you um, at some point. And, and I do think that, that age is a big factor in this. I do think it becomes easier and easier as we move beyond our 40s into our 50s and 60s to say, I, I've, I see through all that stuff. I don't have to. I'm not going to be judged by the car I drive. I'm not going to be, you know, I can remember when we got a new kitchen and we expected everyone to think more, more, more warmly of us because we had a new kitchen. Admire admiring my new kitchen is like admiring me. Uh, complete nonsense. Um, eventually we realize it's nonsense, but it does take a long time. Carl Jung uh, said life begins at 40, uh, up till then it's just research. Uh, and I think there's some truth in that too. Hugh McKay, um, of course I'd like to talk to you a lot longer, um, but we know it's it's hard on Zoom and we thank you so much if you've tuned in this evening. So what I want you to do is go and buy many, many, multiple copies of um, A Question of Love and The Inner Self and you take it instead of wine um, to when you, I'm sorry for people in Melbourne, 
um, just order it online, <laughs> multiple copies, and think this is what I'm going to take when we're finally out of lockdown, because it will happen. It will happen, Melburnians. But Hugh, congratulations. Um, I think you just keep getting better and better, actually. So I look forward to the next books. Um, congratulations. Much. Thank you very much for hosting this. I really appreciate it. Oh, no. Um, I, you know, I value our friendship enormously. My thanks to Pam Lorandis for doing, basically bringing this all together and getting Hugh and I onto Zoom. So thanks so much, Pam. And to Colin Steele and the ANU um, for, for running this event and really contributing to our cultural life in, in such a big way by talking about the inner self, our hiding places, talking about reading about books. Um, I say with great intent, um, go safely and with love. Look for that love, the one we're all capable of, the one we're all born to do. And, um, and don't be frightened of it. I think that's my message from Hugh McKay. Hugh, did you want to sign off in any way? No, I'd endorse that 100%. <laughs> and you know, one thing I didn't say, but perhaps I do need to say as a footnote to that comment, Alex, is that the sort of compassion that characterises human beings has actually got nothing to do with emotion. We don't have to feel love, affection towards someone in order to treat them kindly and respectfully. We do that just because they're humans, not because we like them. Hugh McKay? Um, and the books are called The Inner Self and A Question of Love, one a novel, one non-fiction. You will enjoy them immensely. Thanks so much, everyone. Enjoy your evening.